Well, thank you very much, Dwayne. So our next speaker is Dr. Dave Latham. Uh, he's a wildlife ecologist and has been working at Manaki Whenua for the last 12 years. Dave specialises in wildlife ecology and vertebrate pest control. In his previous research, he studied wolves in Alberta, Canada for about eight years. And if you visit his office, you get to pat some of their pelts, which can be popular when people are visiting. Dave's talk today focuses on detection methods for Dharma wallabies and their findings using a detection dog and handler while searching for fecal pellet groups in different forest habitats. Thanks, Sam. And thanks, everyone, for um, coming along. Um, as a couple of people have alluded to today, there is a big wallaby program. I'm not going to be focusing on the big picture like Duane just did, but rather I'm going to focus on one specific project that we've completed recently. <clears throat> so this particular uh, project focuses on Dharma wallaby. We've obviously been involved in Bennett's wallaby as well, and Graham spoke a little bit about that before. Um, this uh, talk is going to be about one of the commonly used um, surveillance methods, so using detection dogs with a handler. Um, to try and um, uh, find wallabies or confirm that they were there. So it might be following up on a report from a member of the public or something like that. <clears throat> and I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors, um, all with Landcare. So Cecilia and Andrew um, did the modelling and uh, Joe Peace helped me with the field work and logistics. So thanks to them. <clears throat> so I'm not going to spend too much time on the background, I presume, most people know something about Dharma wallaby. They were introduced to the Rotorua district in the early to mid 1900s. They rapidly became invasive and impact native vegetation, agriculture, and silviculture. Um, uh, the most robust data we have on their damage relates to the native vegetation. The other is a little bit more qualitative. Um, and they've progressively expanded their um, geographic range from where they were um, originally released. And they occupy somewhere between 1,800 square kilometers, if we're optimistic, um, out to maybe 4,100 um, square kilometers. So this sort of shows what I mean by that uncertainty. This was some work we did for MPI up to two, uh, uh, 2015. And there are a few things to note here. The first one is you've got a number of um, polygons starting at the dark, um, ready brown uh, center, which is where they were released. That was in um, that polygon was created in 1947, and they've progressively spread, spread out from there. This is up to 2007, the yellow. And you can see that a couple of populations um, lie outside that black polygon, which represents the containment area. And the containment area is an area, a polygon that's been delineated by Bay of Plenty Regional Council, and it's the area that they are going to try to keep the wallabies within. And as you can see, there are numerous um, uh, locations outside of that polygon, uh, so the wallabies have managed to escape, particularly to the west of the polygon. Um, the Rangataiki River is um, forming a reasonably good uh, barrier to their dispersal, um, and then there are a couple of locations down towards Taupo as well. And this is more recent data, and um, I think it shows that there are, is an increasing number out to the west of the containment area, but more importantly, there's um, many more sightings um, creeping down towards Taupo, and there's two locations well to the west which are presumably illegal liberations. So that's another problem that we face as well. <clears throat> so, um, the spread of Dharma wallaby in the North Island and Bennett's in the South Island has led MPI um, to form this National Wallaby Eradication Program, and its um, purpose is to manage this progressive spread. And there's a couple of key strategies that they're um, going to adopt to begin with. So the first one is sustained control within the containment areas, and that's because in some areas the wallaby numbers are very, very high, causing massive amounts of damage to various things, and they want to reduce those numbers down to reduce the damage that they're doing. Um, in addition to that, around the boundary of that containment area, the numbers can be quite high, and uh, wallabies can disperse from there. And so if we reduce wallaby numbers in those buffer areas at the 
um, edge of the containment area. Um, the belief is that it's going to reduce that dispersal pressure that assumes that dispersal is density dependent, which we don't know. Um, and then the other one is, we, I, if we go back to the maps that I showed earlier, we've got these known populations outside of the containment area, as well as a smattering of uh, locations outside there that probably also represent um, breeding populations. We don't, we don't know. Um, but the aim is to uh, locate those, eradicate them, and confirm eradication. So this particular project um, relates to um, the eradication strategy, and in particular, the surveillance component of it. Graham spoke about some of the control stuff earlier, and there's a lot of that going on. Um, this project focuses on one uh, surveillance method. There are multiple um, surveillance methods that are being assessed for both Dharma Wallaby and uh, Bennett's Wallaby. <clears throat> So specifically, we're interested in work that relates to the proof of eradication framework. Many of you will be familiar with um, the proof of freedom framework that um, relates to Osprey, um, TB freedom. Um, so this is similar, but it's uh, focusing um, on the wallabies. And so we were interested in determining the detection probabilities and derived surveillance system sensitivities of detection dogs searching for Dharma wallaby fecal pellets in three types of habitats, native forest, pine forest, and pasture. Um, and then we use these two quantities to estimate the cost per hectare to have confidence using this um, probability of 0.95 that is often used in these frameworks, these models, that eradication has been achieved. So some of you might ask, well, why not one? And it's simply that the amount of survey effort that needs to go um, to be put in to have that level of confidence um, is just really cost prohibitive. So um, a bit of um, a mouthful here, some of this terminology, but I do think it's important to understand it for those that don't already. Um, a detection probability is the probability that an individual device or person dog will detect a specific animal or its sign given the animal is present in the detection range at a specified time. And that specified time is important um, because um, if we've got a marked animal in an area um, and the survey method um, is available to detect it, then great. But if it's left the survey area, um, then it's not available to, to be detected by the surveyor. So they need to um, correspond in space and time. And then the other one is basically just ramping up the detection probability. So <clears throat> it's a probability that multiple devices or people dog search paths will detect a specific animal or its sign, given that it is present anywhere within a total area of interest. And we've been standardizing that to a 100 hectare area. That's what we'll do in this talk as well. So um, the study area, for those of you that know this area, uh, it's Mount Mangatau tree, not in the reserve itself, um, but on um, the slopes, eastern slopes of it, there are three dairy farms at, um, at the base of the mountain and it goes down to the Waikato River. And you've got um, three habitats here, the native, the pasture and the pine. Um, and then you've got white dots in the middle of those polygons. And those represent um, the places where we deployed um, the wallaby pellet groups. So this is what that habitat looks like. You've got the mountain behind, and you've got the pasture, and you've got in front, you've got a bit of bush here as well. That's um, some remnant native forest that's been uh, fenced off from livestock for about 30 or 40 years. That's one of the patches that we um, deployed um, wallaby fecal pellet groups in, and the pine block is off to the side. So um, some of you might ask, well, why did we do this in the Waikato where there are no wallabies? Um, that was done intentionally because if there had been um, wallabies in the area that had avoided pellet groups naturally, we wouldn't have known how many were out there or where they all were, and we needed to know where every pellet group was for the dogs. Um, we deployed 10 to 15 pellet groups per pile, 
at a density of four per hectare in each of the habitats. And that was done um, based on a power analysis um, that showed that we needed about that uh, density of pellet groups if we were able to, interested in uh, detecting a, a meaningful difference between each of the habitats. Um, and it's also based on um, sort of the, the defecation rates of the wallabies, which can be anywhere from 20 to 90 pellet groups per day. And they can remain viable for a number of days as well. So, you know, um, if you've got a single wallaby or two in an area, they can, um, the uh, density of pellet groups out there can accumulate very rapidly. Um, this is what it looks like. It's very cryptic, and I've purposely made it cryptic. Um, so it shows that, you know, it's not very little in the way of a vi visual stimulus here at all. It's the dogs who really have to detect the pellet groups um, that sort of filter down between the grass and into the leaf litter. So we also deployed small pieces of Dell as an experimental control. So we thought, well, maybe the dogs will follow our um, scent trail into the places that we deployed the um, wallaby fecal pellets. So we were interested in trying to tease those two things apart. And we also deployed sheep pellets um, to see if dogs had been trained highly on the wallaby pellets or whether they were interested in herbivore feces more generally. Um, we assessed two different dogs and handlers, and these are the dogs. Um, so with regards to how the handler searched, we told them to do it operationally, as they would do operationally. We didn't draw out transects for them to search or anything like that. Um, they were just to go out and search a patch of native bush or whatever it was, as they would do under normal operational conditions. And we had a land care um, field technician follow along behind the handler with a, a GPS unit collecting a track file, so we knew exactly where that person had been and basically how far the dog was working away. They kept them generally to within about five metres, but it did range out to about 30 metres. So... Uh, Analytically, we estimated uh, the detection probabilities using two approaches. Um, the first one, we assumed that detection was constant across to a maximum perpendicular distance of 15 metres uh, and 30 metres either side of the, uh, the observer. So that created a, either a 30 metre or a 60 metre wide swath. And then we also assumed that detection probability decays with a distance from the observer following a half normal curve. So some results. <clears throat> so we deployed about 300 fecal pellet groups or DAL, 200 of which were um, wallaby, 55 DAL and 46 sheep. Um, the raw data showed that there were 103 detections by dogs and all of these were on Dharma wallaby fecal pellet groups. Um, so the dog, neither of the dogs indicated on DAL or sheep, uh, which suggests that they are really well trained um, for wallaby pellet groups. Um, if we correct um, the data to those pellet groups that were within the search zone of the dogs, we find that the detection probabilities ranged from about 0.59 to 0.89. And this range kind of depends on that assumed effective swath width that I mentioned earlier. So, um, and there were no statistical differences between habitats or different detection dogs and handlers. So these figures, um, summarize that. Um, <clears throat> the axes are the same for both of the uh, figures. So it's the probability of detection, detecting a Dharma wallaby pellet group on the y-axis and distance from path and meters on the x. Um, and then you've got the habitat on the left and the two different teams on the right. And <clears throat> I think the one, there, there's a couple of interesting things to, to look at here. Um, the first one is that um, in the pasture margin, the dogs were able to detect the um, pellet groups slightly further from the handler. And this is probably because it's a more open habitat and the dogs work slightly further away from the handlers because they can remain in visual contact more easily. And the trade-off for that is that it reduces the uh, detection probability at uh, point zero down marginally. And for the two teams, there's a slight difference here too. Um, the second team, the dog worked slightly further away from the handler, finding more pellet groups out there, which again at point zero resulted in a slightly lower detection probability. <clears throat> so 
the detection probability for dogs was relatively high, so greater than or equal to 59%, irrespective of the, of the assessed um, search swath width. But the standardized surveillance system sensitivity, so the SSE, was low. So it was less than or equal to 0 0.035 for a single one kilometer transect in this 100 hectare area. As I mentioned, we standardized it to this area. <clears throat> And this is because the search swath is relatively um, narrow. Um, and so you need ne many transects to increase that SEC in that 100 hectare area. So this shouldn't come as any great surprise. Um, it's the dogs that we used, I think, are very typical. Um, so this is a study um, on brocket deer. And they found that the detection range uh, for dogs searching for brocket deer fecal pellet groups was about 7.2 meters. So it, it appears that fecal pellet groups don't give off a lot of odour and um, the dogs can't locate those from a great distance. Yes, other factors like wind speed, uh, wind direction, um, humidity, all of these other factors are going to affect it, but by and large they can't detect them from a great distance. So um, if we just focus on where we are with the results at the moment and we look at the costs with this um, relatively low um, SEC. Um, if we're trying to achieve this 95% probability of a Dharma wallaby eradication in this 100 hectare area, we're looking at about 1,350, assuming a 60 metre um, effective swath width, or about 1,350 per hectare. So as I mentioned, we've done, um, we've assessed these detection probabilities for other methods as well one of which was for uh, Bennett's wallabies. Um, so we had two hunting dogs and a handler searching for live Bennett's. Um, and that came out considerably cheaper than above. Um, obviously, there are some obvious differences. Um, two hunting dogs versus one detection dog. And the uh, search object is different as well. Instead of searching for a um, pile of fecal pellets, we have um, a live wallaby. And I think the live wallaby gives off a lot more odor, but it also has visual stimulus and it makes a lot of noise as it moves off through the undergrowth as well. And so that created this 200 meter effective swath width. So much um, wider than 30 or 60 meters. So that's what reduces that cost per hectare down considerably. However, as I mentioned, the search objects are quite different things. It's the wallaby that we're ultimately interested in. But in this case, we're searching for um, fecal pellet groups. And because wallabies defecate multiple times per day, we need a correction factor for that because there's any one of a number of fecal pellet groups that the dogs could actually find. So as I said, macropods, which are the wallabies and kangaroos, can produce 20 to 90 pellet groups. So that's not individual pellets, that's pellet groups per day. That's based on some Australian research um, by Johnson. Um, so if we apply this correction factor, how does the SEC and the cost per hectare change? If we use conservative values of 20 voided pellet groups per day, instead of some mean or upper uh, range level, and we assume that they're detectable for only two days. And I think, to be honest, they're probably uh, going to be um, available to the dogs to be detected for a far greater period of time than two days, although there will be some decay factor associated with that. But we'll just stick with conservative stuff for the meantime. So the SSE increases considerably. If we standardize it, it goes from 0 0.019 to 0.25, and this not surprisingly, has a massive impact on the cost per hectare, decreasing it from 13.5 uh, uh, down to potentially as low as 130. And I say potentially because it does kind of depend on um, the proof of eradication framework, um, the uninformative prior we use, et cetera, et cetera. But nevertheless, it does reduce the, the cost quite substantially. What are we doing for time, Sam? Is that a thumbs up? Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so in summary, um, dogs have high efficacy searching for fecal pellets of Dharma wallaby, effective in all of the habitats that we assessed. 
there were no observer biases um, based on two different dogs and two different handlers. It was resilient to light rain. One of the days we had about eight millimeters of rain overnight and that didn't appear to affect the detection probabilities at all. Obviously, if it was very heavy, um, the pellets might disintegrate it totally and the odor could be washed away. Um, the, it was a cost-effective method once we had applied the correction factor, but um, a dog and a handler are limited in the area that they can cover. The dogs tire very quickly. Um, it's, yeah, um, they really concentrate very hard for maybe three or four hours, and then they start to lose focus a bit. Um, and there are just simply not that many dogs or handlers um, uh, trained up at the moment. So, um, yeah, I mean, we need many more um, dogs and handlers out there to cover all of the area. But luckily, there are other um, survey methods as well, um, of which um, drones with thermal imaging equipment or helicopters and thermal imaging equipment or camera traps all of these things can be used as well, um, and they can be used in concert. They don't have to be used separately. Um, so yeah, we would certainly recommend detection dogs as a very valuable part of any surveil surveillance program for Dharma Wallaby. Um, and so thank you. Um, funding is from National Wallaby Eradication Program as well, as Graham mentioned, uh, Waikato Regional Council, um, and land care research. And thanks to the landowners, managers, for letting us do the research on their property. Gus Knolpers, who some of you may be aware of, he does a lot of the dog work, um, canine detection services. And then Travis Ashcroft from MPI, Dave Byers and Alistair Fairweather from Waikato Regional Council. Oh, that was really interesting, Dave. Um, I was wondering, uh, with the training of the dogs, um, does it, I was just wondering if, if the, the fecal pellets that you're using to train in this area where there are no wallabies there versus in areas that you expect them to, to be, um, how would you go about shifting the, the search uh, scent, I guess? Um, because I guess that it might vary on what, what they're eating or that sort of thing. So the um, pellets that we got were from within the containment area um, and they were collected very fresh and then frozen. So we tried to keep that as natural as possible. I think the big thing is um, that this detection probability is probably going to be conservative based in a real life situation because you don't have any urine or um, a scent trail associated with the animal moving around. So I think those are the two big things that are quite unnatural, but it should produce a conservative detection probability, and that's always what we want. So. Um, I'm not really sure of it. Yeah. I mean, all I can say is, and I'm no expert dog trainer by any matter of means, but they do collect the pellet groups up when they train them. So I'm going to presume that that component is reasonably similar. It is being looked at, and um, I'd imagine that Andrew Veal behind you is going to be able to comment on that far better than I can. But there is a, a program up and running with that at the moment. Um, Neil Gemmel is running it, I believe, from the University of Otago. So, yeah, it is certainly being looked at. Um, well, I can't really say. We looked at two different dogs here. I can't remember what sorts they are, to be honest. Um, but uh, Gus actually trains dogs specifically for wallaby fecal pellet groups, and he has other dogs that are trained for live wallabies. Very few of them are able to do both um, search objects. So, yeah, I don't know that the, the species is necessarily key.
Um, so obviously, I mean, when we go back to those figures, it drops off pretty rapidly and down by about 10 to 15 metres, by and large, very few are being um, uh, found out there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's all worked out through the modelling process, um, but um, uh, it's, it's a trade-off, I guess, between the effective swath width and how many are being detected within that range. Um, and it does come out slightly cheaper if you use that um, 60 metre effective swath width. Um, so, yeah, but there are quite a few missed within it as well. Um, so I think that the way it's being used most at the moment is um, if we use illegal liberation as an example, a member of the public has reported that they're in an area um, and there's uncertainty around that. Um, you would get the dogs into there for however many days to search that area and see if you can find something. Um, they could be incorporated into the program um, uh, after you've done an eradication um, program and you are pretty sure that you've got them all, um, you can then put the dog in afterwards and see if they get a detection as well. So there's various ways it could be done. But yeah, I mean, you would tend not to put them into an area um, where you knew there were wallabies already because obviously you would find fecal pellet groups. Um, they will use dogs in situations like that where they're trying to mop up survivors, but that would be using a live wallaby as a target, not the fecal pellet group. questions, I'd like everyone to join with me and thank our speakers from this session.